the court in the house has started. Okay, so hi everybody. So uh, this is uh, time for uh, welcome you to the presentation of uh, Mechatronics topic. Uh, this morning we have uh, five talks about this topic. The first one uh, has the title of Comparative Performance of Two 2D Detectors in the Case of Multipixel Low Contrast Object on a Real Sea Surface. Uh, this work is presented by uh, Maria Karen Gonzalez. This work is from the University of uh, uh, Universidad Autónoma del Carmen, uh, engineering faculty. So let's uh, welcome her and start with our presentation. So please, Maria. Thank you. I'm going to share my, my desk. Can you see my desk? No, not yet. Okay, wait a minute. And now? Yes, now okay. it's visible. Okay. Thank you. Well, my name is Maria Karen Gonzalez Castillo. I'm going to present my article it called comparative format of 2D detector in case of multiplex low contrast object on a real sea surface. Well, first I'm going to present a, a little introduction. Well, uh, MM and CD are the contraction or modified matches to the space detector. Uh, this detector has been recently proposed for detecting a barely discernible object in an agitated sea surface. Also, we can study a uh, the MMSED, uh, the contraction set, matches to the space detector using real images with a synthetic, uh, synthetic model of the reflection from the floating objects. Well, first, uh, we investigate the comparative between MSD and MFSD. Uh, with the energy reflect from the object is equal to energy reflect from the sea. Uh, this paper considers the dependence with, with the detection probability with a fixed probability of false alarm. Uh, first, I need to present the background about the study of the detectors. In 2010, uh, one word compares background suspension with methods. We consider temporal and spatial correlation, showing that those methods of performance the background suspension when they are implemented in a flu to act in background. Later in this year, uh, many detectors uh, who said on background suspension had appeared to solve detection with flux 20 seed with flux 20 uh, uh, GTAC. And the difference in this use the pixel like a filter with disturbance that could be a single pixel. In 2013, uh, assuming that the presence of a target uh, background power of create modify a data to the space detector, that is the detector we are using for this paper. Later in 2014, uh, some works try to improve the main subtraction filter. Uh, 
designing the Caled M modified mean suspension filter or MMF MMS if. But its caster results indicate that higher signal to bar run radio. In, later in, by, uh, the, in, in 2015, these papers uh, use real images to see, but uh, they have various conditions using uh, artificial objects in the sea. And these articles. Uh, my model of reflection from the floating object. Well, first we need to understand two, two things. One is uh, K for M are the images of the temptations or the squares of the temptations. And we have N per L to understand height like object model. N, in, indicate, N indicates the number of rows and L indicates the number of columns. And we need to uh, assume that the floating object is solid and they have some vibration because the sear are in uh, is, is, is agitated. And, the, and also we have a some reflection from the sea. And uh, then we have the signal model of the air TH column vector of the sub-image represented by S earth like H theta earth. H is, is our Balder more matrix and we have uh, this equation. We can theta earth is select like a column of vector with random values is so forming between zero and one and we can see that. Probably density in function is random value is a random is can uh, know how how can is and then, then we have a uh, understand what is about this matrix and and e, e, n represent column number e represent row number and n uh, represent numbers of values in each column now uh, need to need to understand what is the problem formulation and detectors. Well, we are, first we are understand that gain per m. We see that is a detection, and n per l is the object model. Well, then our program uh, convert this in n equal to k, and l equal to m, and we can understand that is uh, that significate that they are. Uh, a false alarm, and we can uh, write this equation: uh, h1 first probability and h each zero one prob first probability and h1 second probability. And then we can uh, we can uh, understand uh, the CM is the barron C, is the barron C, the, the comportament of the how can is the barron and uh, is the represent the channel with noise vector e s m represent the object uh, in a on no deterministic floating object vector and we can understand also that k per p is a matrix of the matrix the Voldemort of Voldemort and uh, which is the span like this, where HMs had a represent. Well, now the second point is K for K less P in our matrix for the Voldemort, and we have uh, another condition here. There are no signal from the object in the of the space here. And the or three point is uh, the matrix H and the matrix one and uh, AAS are respective full rank and is equal to zero. Now we uh, understand the KL 
RT method. We have uh, two detectors and we are doing the comparison between these, those, these two detectors. First is, is, like I said, in the first time, MSD matches to the space detector. It synthesized under the condition that the shape of the signal for the object is unknown. Both the spectral frequency render is now, and we can see the equation. Uh, here, P is a orthogonal protection matrix on the pseudo space of the object. And M is a threshold to show according to the desired false alarm probability. And we have the second detector, MMSD, or modified matches to the space detector. Uh, this is uh, more recently, and uh, it has uh, synthesized under the condition that the frequency range its node which uh, receives signal powers depends of the statistical uh, hypothesis. That is a little difference to MMD. And we have the new, uh, again, the, the equation. When P is the projection matrix onto the space orthogonal to subject space, and we have the pattern variance like a pixel. That is also some different. Well, then, then we can do the comparative uh, between these two detectors, and we can say that uh, MMSD and MFSD uh, terms of false alarm probability and detection probability, and we can use these acronyms for these two for this is the words. And uh, like uh, title said, we had working with two the do the do the processing. Well, uh, another thing that I can say uh, is uh, MSD is sensitive to the radio of power reflection from the power of reflection from the sea. And we know that the power depends on the average and the standard deviation. Uh, also, uh, I have to say that the object is, has, is small, is a little object. And the or value is small also. And we can understand that the standard deviation in the relation uh, of the disparate uh, we can have a decrease in the probability and the detection. Well, uh, the third point is NMSD uh, is sensitive to the reserve signal power chain inside orthogonal to the space, like uh, we uh, see in the in the last page. And um, further, in this section, it will be shown the experiment or comment that can be confirmed uh, in a high quality of MFSD. And we can see uh, some results on our comparative uh, performance. And we have two figures. I don't know if you can see because there are a square. <laughs> okay. And we have figure one and figure two. In this figure, we can see the power spectral or reflection for a typical object. Uh, in this image, we, uh, we have a, a really much. Uh, from the sea, and this image, uh, this object are is under also on the sea, and the object has intention reflection a lot of frequency. Uh, that means that uh, we have a lot of uh, solar uh, UV uh, on the sea, and uh, using this data uh, that we convert to hertz in the computer we can see the, or we can value the parameter P. Uh, this is a parameter that uh, it's functional to, to know uh, how can be the better detection. And we can do the spectral density and level, uh, another, uh, another level like frequency. And we can see the comparative. Well, how can uh, explain the functionality of the detectors? Well, we have a uh, image utility. Uh, we can see the object 
in this red square. And we have uh, that the C is uh, equal to the, to the object. And we have two correlation from two points. First point is in the figure four with the object model, with the object uh, that we uh, suppose from the C uh, in considering the, these parameters or these studies. Later, we compare with the real object and we can see a, a, a near a match or near semejance. And the, later to, to do a lot of experiments, we can uh, show you uh, this, this, these are the most important. The figure six to the figure nine. In the figure six, uh, we are doing, we are uh, detecting with the two detectors with different parameters. We are changing uh, in in age in age detection. MMSD, MMSD with the parameter birth like uh, 0 0.01 and the, there is the same MFD with another parameter and the MMSD with another parameter also. And we can show or we can compare the, the, the detection using uh, these different uh, values or B. And we are compared the label different between object average of the C and the detection probability in the label. Yeah. E, um, we are going to show with the conclusion. Here is MFD allows detecting a low control floating object and implementing uh, when we use MFD. Uh, the experimental estimate of the spectrum with a floating is required. We need the, this date for doing, for implement this the detector. Uh, the assessment of the quality of the detection is equal from MSD to MFD, MMSD. And this carryout of this work working using real images is different to another another articles that using uh, like present in a in a last page in a last page uh, other articles do, uh, doesn't use the the real image or using the real image but only using a surface gaussian process that it's not a good detection and it's all for me and i don't know if you have some questions yeah, we thank you for your presentation. Very clear presentation. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Uh, it can be asked by the chat or uh, you can uh, raise your hand for uh, open voice questions. Otherwise, I have one question. Uh, nowadays, it is very common to use these uh, artificial intelligence applications for extracting images of, uh, based on a kind of training in a, in a big set of images. It, it could be a comparison of those techniques against your, your proposal, like having a lot of uh, several pictures training a, a network, a neural network, and then extracting whether it's an object or not. Yes, uh, we 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 made uh, a lot of videos, a lot of real magic. We insist a word that we need to uh, a lot of time for for doing. And later uh, we compare uh, the, we compare the C alone without object. When the C when the when there was a running, when there was sun uh, UV sun within on the C when there are no rain and there are not uh, there was not the uh, sun and later uh, we 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 uh, have we has the had the the condition of the parameters of the sea and we uh, made a an object model and later implemented 
the two models for compare. Okay, oh, interesting. Is there any question in the audience? No? Okay, well, we thank you and we appreciate your participation with this uh, Congress. We will make you arrive the certificate for this. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, thank you, presenter. So now we have the next uh, talk. Uh, this talk is presented by uh, Jose Lagunas Avila. The title of the article is Obstacle Avoidance in Leader Follower Formation Using Artificial Potential Field Algorithm. Uh, please, can you start your presentation and share your screen? Javier? Yes. yes. <clears throat> I don't know if you can see my presentation. Yes. Yes. So, yes, so should I start? Yeah. There is a clock at the corner of your screen. So, please mm -hmm. try to keep with the 15 minutes. Please go ahead. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming for this our presentation. Uh, our paper title of this presentation is Obstacle Avoidance in a Leader Follower Formation Using Artificial Potential Field Algorithm. Uh, my name is Javier Laguna Savila, and, and I will be the presenter of this presentation. And we did, we did this paper in collaboration with the professors uh, Rafael Castro Linares and Jaime Alvarez Gallegos. Uh, just a little overview of our presentation is a little brief introduction. And uh, next, the navigation in presence of obstacles with uh, two topics of non autonomic mobile robot model that we use, uh, the potential field method. Uh, just a little geometric analysis for the leader mobile robot and the follower mobile robot. Then we use the control algorithm that we implement for the formation robots. And at, at least we use uh, just a little simulations that we implement for the leader follower scheme and the obstacle avoidance in leader follower formation. Uh, and at the end, I will say just a little conclusions that that we made. The control of our mobile robots in uncertain environments, it is a very important field and in research and it calls for many disciplines that includes path planning and obstacles mm -hmm. avoidance. So also the multi-agent system has a wide range of applications, for example, exploration, mapping, and security. So uh, the objective of the formation is creating a geometric positions while the system is moving and each agent reaches the goal in cooperation with other agents. So uh, in this work, we, we deal with two problems. Uh, the first one deals with the possibility of each, uh, each agent move too far away from the geometric position that we create or also, uh, we create a possibility in which agents collide with each other. And the second problem is the avoiding of obstacles in, in, the, in, the, whole, sorry, in the whole trajectory. Um, the leader follower method has been designed for the formation control problem and the artificial potential field for the obstacle avoidance creating two algorithms in the whole system. So, uh, in in research, it exists uh, different methods. So for the formation control problem, for example, the virtual structure, uh, the leader follower method, and the hero formation. And for the obstacle avoidance uh, problems, it has several techniques. For example, uh, FUSI network, sorry, neural network, FUSI control, and potential field. So we use the leader follower method and the artificial potential field. Uh, the main contribution of this paper is to design a control technique for the formation agents in any geometric shape and in any type of trajectory. In addition, a method to avoid obstacles without having to use any kind of search sensors and solving the, the problem. Oh, sorry. For the leader follower strategy in a global reference system, we use a 2.0 mobile robot and we consider the non autonomic constraint that we see in equation number five. And as we can see in figure three, we have the non autonomic mobile robot. So the X and XI and YI are the coordinates for the front of the mobile robot. And this angle that it's C is the heating of the of, is the heating angle of the mobile robot, and D is the distance from the rear axle to the front of the robot that it's here. 
From the non-autonomy constraint that we see in the last slide, in number one, the kinematic model of the IF mobile robot, it is obtained as, as we can see in equation number two. So uh, we can see the control inputs that are the linear velocity, that it's VI, and the angular velocity, WI. Okay, um, so as we can see, we are going to use the non-autonomic non mobile robot. But, but at, as I already said, we have two problems. The first one with the leader that is going to avoid the obstacles and the follower that are going to follow the whole trajectory to the leader. So the potential field method that we are going to use for the leader, it consists in, loca in locating the robot in a selected point in space where the space is represented by the potential field. And this field um, is a set of vectors specifying the forces that are generated by the repulsion of the obstacles and the attractions generated by the goal. So as we can see in figure in figure four, we have the, a little green triangle that is with letter G, that it's the goal. So the robot is going to fall, to go to reach the goal that to reach the triangle, the green triangle. But we have a little obstacle with a little O that they have to avoid. So here with just a little little vector we have a, a repulsion forces that we create that it is created by the robot against the obstacle and we have attraction forces that is reaching the goal these these angles are very important that we 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 use that it's clg that it's the angle of the from the robot to the triangle uh, goal and clo that it's at the angle from the robot to the obstacles it is very important here that we have a little black circle that it's geo that it's a safety zone why we create a safety zone is because we don't know the diameter of the obstacle so we can create a safe a zone that it's very important to avoid the whole obstacle okay um, the potential energy of the total system that we use the as cathy uh, is the total sum of the attraction energy that it's UA and the repulsion energy that is U, UR. And as we can see, we have equations in four and five that shows the repulsion and attraction energy. Um, and it's in terms of the goal and the obstacles. We have like, we have in equation six and seven that it's DG and the O, that is the distance between the current position of the robot and the goal. And the O in equation number seven, that is the current position of the nearest obstacle. N is the number of the obstacles that we have in in the whole in the whole field, and Q, K A and K R are the gains in respect of the attraction energy and repulsion energy. But but as we can say in in research, we have that in potential field they only use forces, and these forces are obtained as a negative energy gradient from the last equation that adds the energy. So more precisely, we have the total force of attraction that is in equation number eight and the total repulsion force that is in equation number nine. OK, um, in the in the leader mobile robot, we know that it exists a big problem, a big common problem in research that it calls local minimum problem. And this is a very big problem because it exists that the repulsion forces and the attraction forces are the same. So as a result of that forces, the robot will not move. So we implement and we have a solution that is to decompose the repulsion force into two forces, as we can see in this figure number five. So FR1, FR1 sorry, is the force in the direction of the line between the robot and the obstacle. And FR2 is the force in the direction of the line between the robot and the goal. So as we can see, this method leads to have a new repulsion forces that it is decomposed in a FR1 that I already said and FR2 and in terms of the distance of the goal and the distance of the obstacles. We have a little KM that it's a little gain that it bases in as a as a gradient in the relative distance of the obstacles and the goal okay and uh, at the end uh, we have like the repulsion and attraction forces are decomposed on their respective axis y and axis axis x 
and it shows in figure that I already said that I told you that it's very important the angles that it's C C L O and C L G. Now, for the follower mobile robot formation, we implement uh, a geometric representation as we can see in figure number six. We have the leader, the leader robot that it's RL and the follower robot that it's RF. In this part, it is very important that the, the follower robot will, will go to the desired position of that we want. So these sections, in this section, it is describing the follower respect to the leader. So we have the geometric model of deformation with L with L sub L F I is the the real the actual position the actual distance from the leader robot to the follower robot. But it is important to mention the L sub L F F I G that it is the desired distance with respect to the leader. So we are going to propose this distance and we are going to propose the bearing angle. The bearing angle is with this part with C sub L F I D. It is very important to show to mention this part because we are going to propose the distance and the bearing angle that we are going to use. So the follower robot will go to the desired position. OK, in the global frame, the desired position of the robot is given by this equation number six, number 16 that it is in terms from the desired position to the leader follower. And similarly, we have the actual position of the robot, of the follower robot, and in terms of the leader robot. So the relative distance between the robot uh, in, in Cartesian coordinates, we, we can see in equations 18 to 20. Okay. Um, as well, the bearing angle between the leader robot and the follower robot is formulated by uh, this equation number 21, that it's in terms of the leader robot, because we, as we already said, we want to propose the bearing angle desired. Okay, um, the tracking error using the desired position of the follower that is in equation last one and the actual position, it is expressed in this, in this equation number 21, and in terms of the desired in desired position and the actual follower position. So uh, to carry out the design method, we propose, uh, we use a control law based on a backstepping method that it's a recursing method that allows to have acetotic stability to zero of the tracking errors. So to carry out the design method, the dynamic model of the tracking error it is obtained by taking the time derivative of equations 22 that are, that are the the equation that I show you in the errors that is in 22 and it follows with a lot of math that is already explained in the paper in equations 23 to 25. Okay, so it is observed in last equations that the desired angle of the follower will have the same as the leader. So this may cause the follower robot rotate before the following trajectory. In order to solve this problem, we proposed a desired angular velocity given as equation number 26. So we can we can solve that problem. And also, we using the dynamic of tracking errors, we are going to propose the control inputs that are for the follower robot in VF and WF, that it's the, uh, the follower velocity control input and the follower angular velocity control input in equations 27 and 28. And to verify this, we, we select uh, a Lyapunov function that is in equation number 29. So we can see that it, it we can see that it solves all the problems in Lyapunov function and now deriving the equation number 29 with respect to the time and substituting all the, the dynamic equations that it's from 23 to, to 25, we have the new equations that it's in 30. So we can see clearly that from kx, ky, and kc, it's bigger than zero. The equation 30, the equation 30, that is the time derivative of the Lyapunov function, it would be, it would be lower than zero. So it guarantees the asymptotic stability to zero for the follower, for the follower tracking the desired trajectory. So uh, we proposed, we proposed. Uh, uh, a constant trajectory with a desired separation of 0.1 and a p radiance of the CLFI using this this lemniscate trajectory and with these coordinates. So as a result, we have uh, 
a little brief of simulation trajectory for the leader forward formation. So we, as we can see, the triangle, the blue triangle is the leader and the red one triangle is the follower. So as we can see, we have the 0.1 meters of separation and the, the P radians of B ring angle uh, in distance. So this is the Lemniscate scale trajectory. So as we can see, we have the control inputs of the robots and tracking errors in leader forward formations, and it follows the whole trajectory. But we can see a little peaks here but it comes from the relative distance. So as far from the leader and the follower will be, it will be more bigger peaks. And we can see the distance, it comes from point one in the whole time that we proposed. So the obstacle avoidance in, in the leader forward formation, we have three obstacles in the ground and we use the gazebo platform using two turtle bolts in a leader forward formation. And we, we propose a distance safe zone that is 1.7 with a separation of 0.3 and a bearing angle of P radiance. And this is a snapshot of the simulation. So as a result, we have the leader for where the leader robot with the blue triangle and the red red triangle, and it, it avoids the three obstacles and it follows the whole trajectory and it goes to the goal, and we can see that it, it accomplished all the trajectory. And also the control inputs of the robots and tracking errors in the leader follower formation, we can see that it converged to the whole trajectory of the leader from the follower, and also we have just a little peaks. And the distance it comes from 0.3 meters in the whole trajectory. So as a conclusion, yes, uh, the method designing for the formation control problem is also based on artificial, so it shows a good performance, avoiding the contact with the obstacles and reaching the goals. And it was perceived that the correct, the correct path following for the follower robot, it is observed that it not collide with each other. Thank you very much. Okay, Javier, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, is there any question from the audience? Please. Feel free to ask. No hands up. Okay, I have a uh, question. You mentioned uh, during your presentation, did you deal with the problem of a uh, minimal local? Yeah. Of, uh, that is a very common problem in this kind of uh, techniques based on, on energy, repulsion yes. and attraction energy. Yes. And you mentioned that for that, you decompose the, the force generated from an obstacle in the two components. One component that is uh, working in the direction of the movement of the robot, and the other one that is related between the direction from the goal to the object. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. But usually the problem of uh, local minima is, uh, appears when you have several objects, such that when you uh, calculate the forces of each object to the, to the robot, then the, the balance of the forces between the goal and all these objects create that minima. Mm -hmm. So how is that the two components of the forces that you are get, uh, getting are enough to solve this problem of local minima? It's because we, we have uh, a little game that we call KM in using the two forces. So for example, uh, the robot is, is moving forward to the goal, but we have the obstacle. So the two, the two forces that we have, it's like creating a little bigger vector so they can avoid the whole the whole the whole obstacle and in this method that we proposed we don't see like a little uh, scar uh, like i don't know how to say for example the robot will do like like this like this like this a lot of this and we don't want this so in the new force that we implement we want a smoother controller so they can go in the whole time but yeah, but once more, you are talking about one obstacle. Uh -huh. and the idea of local minima is that you have several obstacles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you have several uh, repulsion energies mm -hmm. and one uh, attraction energy source. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that can create a, a sort of local minima. I mean, okay. I understand that you designed your decomposition of forces based on one obstacle. But the mm -hmm. problem of local minima usually presents when you have several obstacles into the equation. Okay. Uh, 
well we you we in the simulations we use like four uh, obstacles together so we can see the uh, we can see the performance of the of the mobile robot and we can see the the local minimum and visually we can see the problem will the robot will not move in the whole trajectory but as a result the robot moves and reaches the goal so it shows a good performance in for the repulsion forces and the attraction forces okay well i, I don't want to get into a chat a private <laughs> chat you and i this is an interesting uh, work is there any other question from the audience no okay well we thank you javier for your presentation and your participation in, in this uh, conference and we will continue with uh, our next presentation. Well, we thank you, Javier. Thank you very much. So uh, for the next presentation, the presenter is going to be Hetzail was so soon. It's correct. OK. Can you put your presentation, please? Can you share your screen? Of course. <clears throat> OK. So the title of the next presentation is uh, Single Board Computer-Based Architecture and Firmware for radiometers with uh, radio astronomy applications. As I mentioned, this uh, work is going to be presented by Yesael Kuasuson. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You have 15 minutes for your presentation. You can start. Thank you. So uh, good morning to everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about the electronic architecture and the, of the main control stage and, um, and I'm going to describe you the use of peripherals management firmware of a dual channel water pipe or radiometer that we use in radio astronomy. So in this talk, uh, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, a little introduction uh, about ra radiometers and some radiometers that we use in some observatories. Then we are going to talk about the design of our system based in the architecture, the firmware, and the survey, co survey code that uh, we use for the sky tipping and the sky characterization. Finally, we we'll talk about some results and the conclusion of this work. So the radiometers basically are radio frequency receivers that measure noise power from a radiation source. Especially the water pipe radiometers measure the sky opacity at uh, observatories in order to get the sky characterization and check the uh, atmospheric transmission to do radio astronomy uh, observations. The radiometer consists in, in four basic elements an antenna, a band pulse filter, a square load detector, and an integrator. In this figure, I show you additionally a recorder. Uh, because the, all the data is collected in this uh, in this component. And radio astronomy, uh, there are uh, high frequencies that goes from uh, gigahertz to terahertz, and in this way we use uh, the heterodyne technique in order to uh, perform uh, uh, lowering lowering frequencies to perform the data acquisition with uh, the uh, actual electronics. Um, uh, these instruments uh, use different electronic architectures that uh, uses additional components as well as stations, communication interfaces, and servo mechanisms. Now uh, I'm gonna present you three different radiometers that uh, were used and are used in observatories in Mexico and South Africa. This is the Servi trees. This is the local radiometer of the San Pedro Martin National Astronomy Observatory in Baja California. It was designed by the University of Massachusetts Amherst in 1994. It is a two, uh, 250 gigahertz material and receiver, and it has a digital signal processor that performs all the control and monitoring of the data of the instrument. It also has a servo mechanism that performs the control of the uh, mirror sky um, radiation uh, fit horns and um, it also implements a syncable computer as a network interface in order to communicate with other components. Then we have the RPG tip 225. This is the Alfonso Serrano Large Millimeter Telescope Radiometer. 
It was made by uh, Radio Matter Physics uh, at uh, Germany in, in 2010. And this is a 225 gigahertz Teradyne receiver. It is uh, so, uh, the, the, this uh, architecture is a centralized in an industri industrial personal computer that performs the control of a servo mechanism. It reads, reads and monitors the weather station and uh, uses a serial interface to communicate with external components. And finally, uh, this is the WBR3 radiometer. It, this is the local instrument of the Hartibisto Radio Astronomy Observatory at South Africa. And it was, it was made by the uh, Institute of Technology of Zurich and CapTech in uh, 2000s. Uh, <clears throat> unlike the last two radiometers, this is a dual channel water vapor radiometer with the Tarotline receiver tune it at 23 and 31 gigahertz. This um, use a external personal computer in order to control and monitor all the variables in the radiometer. It also have two servo mechanisms, uh, unlike the two large radiometers, and <clears throat> it uses serial interface for communication with each component of the architecture. <laughs> Sorry. The system uh, is based in this last radiometer. We call this new system as WBR3 Plus, and it takes some of the future of the last radiometers that I mentioned before. From the survey tree, I take the components of the electronics, the single ball computer implementation, and the sky tipping method. From the RPG, we take the data structure, um, and the remote communications uh, method, the connectivity with others, with uh, some um, uh, interfaces, and the software processing. From the original WBR3, we take the hardware, the architecture, and the computer user interface. Because this radiometer used a, a graphic interface with LabVIEW uh, for some external computers. So this is our architecture based in the last features. And this architecture is now implemented in this new radiometer. As you can see, this is centralized in our, a single ball computer. In this case, this is a Raspberry Pi that ha has connected uh, several uh, components. Um, from let me show you a laser. Um, in this section, we have a temperature interfaces that read the temperatures of the RF receivers. There are two uh, interfaces for each receiver. Uh, this one is uh, sing the signal conditioning section that is uh, com uh, that consists in uh, a single conditioning board. Uh, this is a custom made board, uh, and it has connected the ADC that communicates via I square C to the Raspberry Pi. The temperature interfaces con uh, are communicated um, from the Raspberry Pi Pi by SPI. Um, over here we have the switch driver board. This is a custom made board also, and it is based in one bit um, and digital uh, interface. Um, over here we have um, two different sensors, um, and this is the basically the weather station. We take the ambient temperature and humidity and the pressure, uh, the barometric pressure of the ambient. So this one uh, communicates via I square C and this one communicates via SPI. And over here we have the servo mechanism section. As you can see, uh, there are two uh, different uh, motors, one for the elevation uh, mechanism and one for the azimuth mechanism of the radiometer. Each one has connected one in immersion measurement unit in order to get the angle, the position angle of the of each um, mechanism. This one is a pulse width modulation interfaces, um, serial interface, sorry, um, via I square C to the Raspberry Pi that um, uh, controls uh, these uh, two power stages based on a bridge technique to uh, manipulate uh, each motor. And finally, we have this um, um, 4G and uh, wireless communication interface to provide the, that. Um, that work to the uh, to the to this system. So, 
So um, this is uh, how uh, part of our uh, system looks like. It, it is uh, integrated by this section, the central processing unit. This is the Raspberry Pi. Uh, the scenario controller that is uh, integrated by the switched driver board that we made, uh, it is based on uh, a relay interface. The temperature monitor that is uh, integrated by uh, RTDs, uh, PT100 like. And it, uh, our, uh, the data is reading via the MAX3185. Uh, 65 uh, RTD digital interface. The signal acquisition section is um, component by the signal conditioning board, custom design also based on uh, AMPS, and it has connected the ADC, uh, the board from Adafruit. Then we have the controllers, the elevation and the azimuth have uh, basically the same components, but uh, different uh, items. So uh, the LS9DS1 is the universal measurement unit and the AQMH3407 is the edge bridge and the PCA9685 is the PWM interface. Then we have the BMP28280, that is the pressure sensor and the HDU21, that, that is the ambient temperature and humidity center for the water station. And finally, we have the networks that consist in a, a, a serial interface for the Raspberry Pi that has connected a 4G network adapter. So uh, then there we have the firmware that consists in two different codes. Uh, these codes are implemented in Python 3.5. And the hardware module uh, is basically the code of firmware that communicates with uh, all the hardware in the system. Uh, this uh, code first uh, read the receiver's temperature, is in charge to perform the elevation and azimuth control. Uh, um, it also acquires the RF signals, uh, monitors the weather station, checks for errors in each uh, hardware and create a data file that um, um, stores all the, the data from, from each sensor. And the WBRSA is the survey code, the code, sorry, um, that performs the sky tipping for observations. Basically, uh, this uh, code set, uh, uh, yes, um, check for the desired angles uh, for azimuth and elevation mechanisms. These are introduced by the user. Uh, the user also sets the RF switching modes for observing the different sources of the radiometer. I mean, uh, for seeing the antenna, for see the noise source, and for see the reference load of the radiometer. Then uh, the code uh, made a hardware module check-in, or I mean uh, this, uh, this code checks for all these steps on the hardware module code. And then uh, the user set the survey time steps. This is according to the needs of the observation, so it's a, a randomly uh, time step. And finally, this code uh, check another, uh, another time for uh, uh, errors over the process or interruptions. And uh, <clears throat> as, as a result of the implement of uh, the WBRSA code, we have an, an data file that consists in um, some uh, variables that the system collects during observations. First one, we have the data type, and um, this is a single column in a string file type. And then we have the angles. We have four angles uh, um, for the system. I mean, uh, we have the um, uh, desired angle and the reached angle by the uh, by the system, uh, and there are two angles for each uh, mechanism. Then we have four temperatures that I mentioned before in a flow type. Uh, then we have the receiver voltages that consist in six columns that have the voltage 
the voltages of the antenna, the voltages of the reference load source, and the voltage of the uh, noise source um, uh, um, source in a uh, flow type. Uh, I mean, uh, there are three three different voltages for each receiver. And finally, uh, the two columns of the weather uh, station variables for ambient temperature and barometric pressure. Additional, additionally, we have uh, a daemon code in order to schedule uh, every survey text according to the user. And uh, we also have a logger code that uh, <clears throat> record every, every error or every events during the observance. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> I'm going to show you some results from the characterization of the system. This is the body plots for signal acquisition board. And as you can see, uh, there are um, uh, uh, signal, uh, linealized signals um, over um, for frequency less than uh, 10 kilohertz. So um, this is uh, taken into consideration to implement in the um, code for the ADC. You have one, one more. Minute. Minute. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, we have here the time resolve, response of the servo mechanism. This is for elevation, and as you can see, it reaches the angle uh, in, with an accuracy of uh, 0 0.5 and, uh, degrees. And the servo mechanism of azimuth reaches the desired angle with an accuracy of plus minus 1 degree. There are uh, some uh, main technical details for the WBR3 uh, plus. And uh, I can um, say that the signal conditional bandwidth uh, is taken from um, uh, one uh, millihertz to uh, one kilohertz. The elevation accuracy and the estimate accuracy, as I, as I mentioned before, goes from 0 0.5, 0 0.5 degrees and uh, 1 degree for estimate. The temperature accuracy of the sensors goes from plus minus 0 0.2 degrees Celsius. And the water st station sample time needs to be uh, 12 uh, uh, seconds. And finally, uh, the cycle time for the system and um, around the one minute and the conclusion of this work. Uh, so I can say that the Raspberry Pi optimizes the monitoring and the control of the radiometer and its processors uh, performs the data reduction after sky tipping uh, due to the performance of this uh, device. Its subsystem fulfills the needs of the sky tipping processes and as the server code is um, customizable, uh, the user can make another uh, code to perform the sky tipping. The new capabilities that provided to the radiometer are the wireless communication via Ethernet and Wi-Fi, the graphic remote control, and the open source firmware code. And this operating system of the Raspberry Pi allows to test different data reduction methods with different programming languages. There are some references of the work, and this is all for me. Thank you, and I hope you have any questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any we questions? Have any questions? Uh, yes, yes, we have. Uh, Valente. Yes, uh, please uh, explain us why the 23.8 gigahertz 31.5 gigahertz, and that's a 7.7 .7 gigahertz separation from those frequencies. Why are those frequencies used for this? Sorry, you are uh, thinking about uh, why uh, why the uh, why we use this frequency in the radiometer, or exactly what those frequencies are used? Ah, uh, we use the both. We use the bus. So uh, depending of the uh, uh, data reduction method, the users uh, um, decided to use both channels or just single channel. So it's not necessary to use the the two channels, but um, uh, it, it depending on of the survey method. And specifically, why those frequencies are used for uh, radio astronomy? For astronomy, we see the 
the water vapor uh, transmission on the atmosphere. Uh, there are so many um, absorption lines for water vapor, but in altitudes that goes from um, one kilometer and two kilometers, the 23 and the 31 gigs, it's an important uh, absorption line of water vapor. And for example, in the uh, large millimeter telescope, an important absorption line is the 20, the, the 2050 gigahertz. So the, the line absorption depending on the altitude of the atmosphere. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Well, we thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Now we will move to our next uh, presentation, please. Uh, how can I? Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Have a nice so day. So for the next presentation, we have for the title Automotive Engine Fault Detection and Isolation Using LSTM or Model Based Residual Sequence Classification. This work is presented by Mohamed Youssef. And this is a, a work done by Mohamed Youssef and Hisham Ibrahim. Well, sorry, are with the Yemen University in Cairo, Egypt. So, Mohamed, please, if you can share your screen. Okay. Uh, is it visible? Yeah, it's. Uh, the screen is not visible. There is the clock. You have 15 minutes for our presentation, and then we have five minutes for questions. Uh, please just share your screen. No. And now? Uh, wait a minute. Okay. okay, now is it visible? So, okay. you can start the presentation. Thank you. Uh, hello, my uh, name is Muhammad Yusuf Sulaiman, and today I will be presenting uh, our paper uh, titled Automotive Engine Fault uh, Detection and Isolation Using LSTMs for Model-Based Residual Sequence Classification. Uh, today we'll go through uh, an overview over the fault diagnosis of automotive engine in general, uh, the use of neural networks in uh, fault diagnosis, uh, the methodology covered in this work, and uh, finally we will have a look at the results and discussion uh, and the conclusion. Uh, first, uh, automotive engine have uh, have witnessed a tremendous uh, development throughout the year that have been made possible uh, due to the increasing number of uh, the mechatronics component uh, in the engine. Uh, nowadays, an automotive engine can be equipped with around uh, 50 electronic sensor and 2 to 30 electric actuator. Uh, they all are involved in uh, different aspects of uh, the engine uh, functionalities. Uh, with this increased complexity, the uh, task of uh, supervision uh, has turned from uh, just uh, limit checking of some variables of the engine like the oil or coolant temperature into more uh, sophisticated methods. Uh, commonly uh, referred to as analytical methods of fault diagnosis. Two of the most commonly used uh, analytical methods are signal analysis and model-based uh, methods. Today we will have a brief look on the model-based methods. Uh, Model-based methods uh, rely on constructing a mathematical representation that, uh, that determine the dependencies between the inputs and the output of uh, the process. Uh, and by constructing this model, uh, we can uh, actually detect the change in the states or the parameters of the process based upon which we can uh, make our decision about the, uh, the behavior or the condition of the process. Uh, second, we uh, start to extract uh, the uh, after con after constructing our model. We use it to in order to extract our uh, features. These features can be mapped into what we call a symptom vector. Uh, this symptom vector uh, can uh, can be directly mapped into our uh, into our faults. 
Uh, the limitation to this uh, method is that they are uh, the manually designed feature extractors uh, becomes more and more uh, difficult uh, become more and more difficult to be designed uh, uh, with the increasing nonlinearity and complexity of the uh, process. Additionally, it becomes more time consuming and needs uh, a lot more expertise. That's why computational intelligent methods uh, become powerful. Uh, one of the most known tools uh, of computational intelligence is a neural network. Neural network is a mathematical structure that mimics the uh, human brain, and they are seen as a nonlinear function approximators. Uh, <clears throat> they have been used uh, widely for uh, fault uh, or health monitoring uh, purposes. Uh, due to their uh, capabilities in system identification, uh, feature extraction, pattern recognition, and classification. Uh, unluckily, uh, the uh, conventional usage of uh, neural network uh, was uh, only limited to the end of uh, the spectrum of fault diagnosis, uh, which corresponds to mapping the analytical symptoms into uh, corresponding faults. Uh, this puts more emphasis on the manual feature extraction part and uh, constrains the deep learning capabilities of the network to extract uh, the hidden features. Uh, in this paper, we, uh, we propose a methodology that utilizes, uh, utilizes uh, the long short term memory neural network. Uh, this uh, type of neural network is a, a dynamic neural, neural network that is used to process the time dependencies between a sequence of uh, data points. <coughs> uh, the contributions can be summarized as follows. Uh, utilizing neural network, uh, we, we actually uh, uh, utilize the, um, or use the maximum potential of uh, neural network in feature extraction rather than manually extracting the feature ourselves. Uh, this uh, gives more flexibility and uh, uh, consumes less time in uh, the process of modeling uh, the engine. Uh, and uh, this method is adaptable to both uh, data-driven and physical-based models, and it's uh, also suitable for onboard as well as off-board uh, diagnostics. Uh, our methodologies can be uh, our methodology can be summarized as follows. First, we construct an engine uh, model in order to synthesize our data, and in order to uh, induce the faulty behavior in our engine model, uh, we construct uh, some uh, for, uh, some models for our faults. Uh, then we use the pre-constructed models in order to uh, synthesize our training and validation data. And finally, we uh, train the network and uh, see the results. First, the uh, first part is the engine modeling. Uh, due to the high complexity of uh, the combustion process and the rapidly changing parameters, uh, uh, the phenomena uh, that occur within uh, the engine cycles uh, is inaccessible for supervision. And uh, uh, modeling these processes is uh, complex and computationally expensive. That's why uh, most of the literature uh, relies on what we call uh, control-oriented models. These models uh, offer a, a reasonable accuracy with uh, low computational complexity. As, you, uh, as we know, the, uh, the engine can be seen as a structure that uh, takes in an air and fuel uh, mixture and through combustion or uh, the ignition of this mixture, uh, a mechanical power is generated. And based, uh, based on this, we can dissect our modeling of the system into uh, three or four subsystems. First, the air dynamics part. Uh, this part uh, covers the uh, <coughs> or computes the air charge that goes into the cylinders uh, for combustion based on the uh, electronic uh, signal or the actuating signal of the uh, throttle valve. Second, the fuel dynamics and lambda controller, uh, both of these subsystems uh, compute the amount of uh, fuel in order to be uh, the adequate amount of fuel to be injected uh, to, the air, uh, to the corresponding air charge in order to maintain a, a stoichiometric ratio for uh, combustion. Uh, this ratio is ideal for uh, use 
in catalytic uh, converters. And finally, we will uh, uh, the crankshaft dynamics. The uh, the crankshaft dynamics actually uh, compute the power generated uh, from the combustion of the predetermined uh, air and fuel mixture and uh, determines the available power at the output shaft. <clears throat> Uh, so, in order to uh, synthesize, uh, in order to induce uh, faults into our uh, engine model, some of the fault models need to be constructed. Uh, in this uh, in this work, we discussed two uh, faults: first, an intake air leak and a manifold pressure sensor disturbance. Uh, first, let's take a look at the intake air leak. Uh, this is a common problem that occurs. Uh, Due, uh, that occurs due to the improper fixing of uh, the connected hoses uh, into the manifold body or uh, through physical holes in the uh, manifold body or the hoses themselves, which causes the leak of, uh, of the uh, air into the manifold body, uh, leading to a deterioration in the performance of the engine. Uh, this problem can be modeled as an additive disturbance uh, the amount of the mass that leaks into uh, the manifold body is computed using an effective leakage diameter and based on uh, other parameters such as the manifold uh, temperature and pressure and the ambient pressure, the amount of uh, mass that leaks into the manifold is computed. Uh, second, uh, we uh, consider the manifold pressure sensor disturbance. Uh, the sensor uh, can be uh, exposed to different type of disturbances. Uh, one of uh, the most commonly occurring is uh, the uh, electromagnetic influences that superimpose the readings of the sensor, uh, leading to biases in the output of the sensor reading. Or uh, some environmental disturbances, such as the temperature, the fluid flow velocity, or contamination, could lead to uh, altering the parameters, uh, the dynamic parameters of the sensor, and causing a deviation in its reading as well. Uh, in order to induce these uh, faults into uh, the engine model, a fault generator block is constructed, which can uh, determine the disturbance variables uh, in two different ways. Uh, first, uh, uh, by using the previously discussed uh, fault models, uh, we can determine the behavior of uh, the faults by identifying a certain fault in intensity and time dependency. Uh, the intensity of the fault is determined by, uh, by giving a value to each of the effective diameter or uh, Z1 and Z2 expressing the uh, sensor disturbances. Uh, these disturbances can take different uh, behavior. Uh, it can be uh, suddenly changing or abrupt, like this one, or it can be increasing with time or uh, can be intermittent. Second behavior of, uh, that uh, the fault generators can, uh, can produce is a, a stochastic uh, behavior. The stochastic behavior is, uh, is, uh, is by making a random disturbance, uh, a random disturbance with no specific time, uh, time behavior affect our, uh, our engine. Uh, these, uh, this random disturbance is uh, defined by uh, three parameters, the frequency, the mean, and the variance of this uh, signal. Uh, finally, in order to generate our uh, training data, uh, we ran two models in parallel, uh, one representing our faulty engine behavior and the other one represents our healthy uh, engine model. And uh, by running the two in parallel, we extract the difference in the reading between the two models in order to construct our residual vector, which contains information about the RPM, the manifold pressure, the cylinder air mass flow, and the fuel mass flow. In order to, uh, to extract uh, data from different operating zones of the engine as well, we made sure uh, to uh, cover a wide range of operating uh, uh, of operating ranges uh, regarding the uh, our engine by varying the throttle angle which represents the uh, demand of the torque demanded uh, from the engine as well as the uh, torque exerted on the engine by the load. 
we simulated the different operating condition for uh, healthy operating condition of the uh, the residuals generated in case of the healthy operating condition of the engine in case of having a mass leak into the manifold or in case of having a pressure sensor failure uh, the, the the training and validation data were was uh, generated uh, were generated in uh, using two different approaches. Uh, first, the training data was used uh, was generated using the stochastic fault, uh, fault model or uh, uh, or in the form of a, a random disturbance uh, covering the three operating condition. We yielded a 24 uh, simulation run in total, and uh, for validation data we used the structured uh, fault model. Uh, the reason behind this is uh, to test the generalization capabilities of the network uh, um, as, uh, as to see the results of uh, or its performance against uh, identifying the source of disturbance regard regardless of uh, its uh, behavior. Uh, finally, the network training phase. Uh, uh, different network structures uh, structures were tested uh, were, were tested against our uh, data sets. The two layered networks showed a faster convergence or in less iterations of time it uh, learned the training data sets while for uh, while it had poor general generalization capabilities as it can be seen from this chart the uh, Black dotted line represents the validation data. There is an offset between the two accuracies, while uh, for three-layered network, the, uh, it, uh, it required more uh, time, but it actually, uh, the, both uh, the validation and the training data uh, acquired a similar performance. Uh, results and uh, now let's take a look at our results. Uh, this confusion matrix represents the different uh, our uh, the, the results or the performance uh, of our uh, neural network against uh, the uh, generated uh, simulations uh, for uh, 252 uh, sensor for different cases. The model uh, with the neural network was able to identify them correctly uh, with 100 percent accuracy as well as for the intake uh, manifold leakage uh, but it shows a tendency uh, to uh, classify the healthy operating uh, condition or sequences uh, as an intake leak and this uh, was found to be due to the uh, cl close relation or the close behavior in the residual of both uh, of both operation uh, operating conditions uh, as we can see from this graph uh, this is a plot of the residual signal extracted from uh, the engine while operating at a healthy uh, conditions and at a five millimeter diameter leak in the manifold uh, in the manifold body. Uh, uh, this uh, this could be avoided either by uh, modeling the, uh, the uh, by modeling the mass leak uh, by a better dynamic model or by neglecting the uh, by neglecting such uh, small. Uh, small leakages as they contribute in uh, an insignificant amount of leakage into the manifold. Uh, now we can conclude that the neural, uh, the long short term memory neural network uh, has a great potential in uh, fault detecting of uh, automotive engines. Uh, they, they offer high, fl uh, high flexibility and less demand uh, for uh, for expertise in modeling the system, and additionally, uh, the ability of uh, network to classify unseen data uh, implies the ability to synthesize our training data without downgrading performance. This could be a huge uh, deal when uh, when we deal with such valuable components, uh, where uh, obtaining failure data could be costly. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mohamed. Well, we have a. Uh, any question from the audience? We have time for a short question. Okay, I, I have one, Mohammed. What is the idea uh, behind your project? Like to substitute the signal fault detection that is usually in this kind of engines 
or to have a kind of redundancy system for fall detection of identification of the fall in a, in a sort of more isolated uh, fall detection system. Can you read the question? It's not so clear. Sorry. OK. I mean, what is the intention of your work? To substitute the uh, signal-based fall detection system that is usual in engines, or to have a sort of redundancy system? Uh, for more complex systems, it could be replaced. Okay. Uh, signal analysis could be difficult to uh, obtain or, or, or to apply in such cases. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, the, uh, we aim to explore the, the, the usage of uh, neural network in general as it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a trend. Uh, so, uh, and this uh, this uh, area of research is not uh, thoroughly discussed. So, uh, the main aim was to explore how uh, such tools would behave uh, against uh, such a problem. Okay, now in that sense also, uh, this is always a big question like how many layers uh, and how many neural networks, uh, sorry, neural, you need in H1 to have a good uh, result. You compare two lawyers and three lawyers, and you mentioned like with three lawyers, is it a better uh, identification of a fault detection? Nevertheless, it is slower. Is it still enough uh, quick response of the three lawyers for a fault detection online? Or is it going to be a kind of compromise on, on the response of the neural network? You you are asking about having a less number of layers or more number of layers? Yeah, I mentioned like you say that it's uh, interest of your work like to use neural networks and to see whether it works fine. Yeah, uh, you have three layers. You say that this is lower convergence. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, the lower number of uh, layers had the faster convergence, but uh, the performance was not so good at generalizing. Yeah, but for instance, with three layers, it is still fast enough for a good identification of because it is a slower. You had already a problem with the time of convergence. Uh, in general, it's uh, trained offline. For, uh, that's why uh, it's not. Uh, it doesn't really matter here. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this uh, the, this the variable of time uh, could be uh, scaled uh, according to different variables such as the data, uh, the uh, the amount of data available for training and so on okay well thank you very much we appreciate your participation in our conference so it was very nice to have international participation well we thank you mohammed very much and we will move to our uh, next and final presentation of this session. So this uh, final talk has a title Tuning, Control and Path Planning of a Spherical Robot Using Stochastic Signals. Yeah. This work is done by Sergio Daniel Sanchez Solar, Gustavo Rodriguez Gomez, Angelica Muñoz Melendez, and Jose Martinez Carranza, all of them from INAOI. So please, you are willing to share our screen. Uh, your screen to us, please. Okay. Sergio Daniel Sanchez, the presenter. Okay, now you can see my, well, can you see my, my screen? Okay, now we can see. So please start with your presentation. Okay. So, hi everyone. I'm Sergio Daniel Sanchez Solar from the Inaue, from the Computer Science Department. And I am I am going to talk to you about the advances of our research on spherical robots or spherical mobile robots. And the title of the paper is Chaining Control and Path Planning of a Spherical Robot Using Stochastic Stochastic Signals. So <clears throat> Here's the outline that we are be going following. And well, first of all, mobile robots are commonly used in land exploration and space exploration. And this is one of the advantages or the that, that we are going to, to to take. So 
in this case we are focusing on spherical robots specifically in spherical robot driven by one simple pendulum so these kind of systems have a lot of advantages again other kind of mobile robots considering the, the application that we want to, to give it so the first advantage is that their inner components are protected from damage such as external shocks uh, and external conditions such as humidity uh, dust water and so on um, the the minimal area of contact that these kind of robots have with the surface uh, lets us to have uh, to have low friction and low energy consumption consumption and these kind of robots due to their spherical shape are not capable of overturning so we can recover the robot in in a hard, in harsh environments so the first disadvantage that these kind of robots present is that they are non holonomic systems that means that they have many uh, or some uh, restrictions on their motion and it's difficult to 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 realize the planning with these kind of roads. So here is the mathematical model of the system where we are getting the Lagrangian of the system using this equation, where we have a, the energies of the system, such as kinetic energy of the sphere and the pendulum, the rotational energy of the sphere and the pendulum, and the potential, and the potential energy of the sphere and the pendulum, both with respect the centroid of the sphere. So these are the energies that, that we are using and the description of all of them. So the parameters that we are using are these that are presented in this slide. So we have the masses, the radius, the, distance, the distances, the angular velocities of the sphere and the pendulum. The rotation angle, uh, this uh, mathematical model is for longitudin longitudinal motion. So we are considering the rotation angle of the sphere and the rotation angle of the pendulum. We have the moments of inertia of the system and well, the acceleration, the acceleration of the gravity. So when we obtain the equation of Lagrange, we are considering two generalized coordinates that are both angles of the system so we have theta is and theta p and we when we extend this equation we we obtain these two equations that are shown and so we can see the friction force between the spherical and the surface and the torque that is going to be supplied the, by, by the motor to the system to the, to perform a longitudinal motion. So we are using a PID controller, and we have to consider that the, the that we are going to control the the speed of the of the spherical robot through the the torque of the DC motor. So. Uh, and, and the friction force is described in this in this expression where we have a, the, the normal force between the robot and the surface and the viscous friction so this model is being uh, linearized so we are considering that these angles and these uh, angular velocities are small enough to let us to 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 linearize system so in the figure we can see the linearization linearization of cosine on the left side and the linearization of sin on the right side so we can see that the values obtained from from the linearization and the function are very similar so we can consider that that the linearization is possible in this system and when we Linearization, linearize sorry, this uh, system, the term 
mu of n is eliminated. So we have the system in, in this slide where we can see the matrices and the vectors of the of the system in the state space model, where we can see that uh, the y vector is has a, uh, and one on the second column because we are going to control the angular speed of the sphere. So this is the transfer, transfer function that we are using. It's a third order uh, system and the poles uh, are shown in these expressions where we can see that the system is stable. And we are presenting the parameters of the real of the robot that we are using on our model. So in this case, we are using a, a stochastic signals to generate a perturbance to, to make the system more robust, more robust against uh, disturbances. So the model that we are using for for generating these stochastic signals is uh, is that we have a random number number generator that or whose output is going to a halt. This halt is connected to a, a linear filter, and then we obtain the stochastic signal. So we are using uh, two filters, one of first order, uh, to generate the disturbance signal for the angle or the, velo the angular velocity of the pendulum. And, uh, and the second order filter to generate the disturbance to the set point. So this is the cost function that we are using. And for lateral motion, we are using the, the, the model that is presented in the figure on the left. And we have uh, the curvature radius that we are calculating to be followed or to be considered by the system. So we can calculate the steering angle using the, the second equation. And to the, the, the oscillation of the, of, the, of the pendulum, we have many sideways oscillations that, that are filtered using, using a complementary filter that is shown in the last equation to to eliminate or or minimize these oscillations to reach the point that we are going to or that we want to reach so this is the values that are used in the complementary filter where we have the angles the, the estimate the estimated steering angle or the calculated st steering angle the measured the measured steering angle that we are get, uh, obtaining from a from a position sensor, the measured rolling angle, the angular velocity of this of, of the spherical robot that is being uh, obtained by a gyroscope, and the parameters of the of the complementary filter, and the sample time that we, we are using on the simulator to to develop this uh, work. So we have here the, the simulation results where we have a, the representation of the state space model. Yeah, will you will we substitute all the values that we presented before? And we are introducing some uh, gains to to the to, to the method of of conjugate conjugate gradient for polar Rivier. And after <clears throat> run this uh, algorithm, we obtain the gains shown below. And these gains are the, the gains that we are introducing to the system or to the PID control. So we we have the two two graphics or two plots where we can see in the left right the set point or the, the behavior of the system considering the set point that we are using the, where we are introducing the disturbance against the the output of the 
the system. And on the left uh, side, on the right side, sorry, <coughs> we are seeing the comparison between a PID tuned using a Sealer Nichols uh, strategy and stochastic signals. So we can see that stochastic signals uh, have a better performance due to it doesn't have um, uh, overshoot and the response is faster. So we are simulating these uh, results on, on virtual environment webots. And well, we have to consider that the first DC motor is attached to the transversal axis to perform longitudinal motion, and the second motor is attached at the end of the pendulum, uh, and, um, where where the axis and the pendulum is are, are crossing, and the desired desired longitudinal angular velocity is of less four rats per second. So we simulate some uh, trajectories where we propose the first such uh, reach a goal located, located on a parallel axis. We have two alternatives for this. So we consider that we have two objects uh, that are that do not permit that do not permit to the system to to perform semicircular trajectories. So we have to 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 perform longitudinal motion and once we are located uh, orthogonally to the point that we want to reach we perform a circular motion some circular motion so we have some videos of the, of the experiments where we can see that the robot reached the first point that we are proposing and then performing its its performing a semicircular trajectories. So it's it's reaching the points. The second alternative is, is that now the obstacle is just in front of the system, so we can change the axis performing a different uh, trajectory. So we have uh, the, the video where it is performing first circular motion and a second circular trajectory to reach the desired uh, axis. And then when we are on the desired axis, we are performing longitudinal motion to reach the point. So another uh, trajectory is to change the, the direction of the spherical robot, considering that uh, this kind of robots doesn't have a jaw motion, so it has to to perform a, a very long uh, trajectory to reach the point, but it is uh, reaching the desired point. So here we are reaching the second uh, goal. And finally, it's performing a third semicircular motion and is reaching the desired point. So the last is a uh, uh, infinite shape symbol where we are performing a elementary four uh, trajectories. So here the, the difficult of the system is that the pendulum has to change the inclination for, from a positive value to a negative value where we have a, a, a disturbance that the controller is capable to, to deal with. So we are reaching all the points that we are proposing and reaching the initial position. So the conclusions are that PRD, PID with stochastic signals is used for longitudinal motion in this case and PID controller uh, for lateral motion. This <coughs> control applied to the system is more robust than uh, PID control tuned used uh, Sealer-Nichols technique. 
the two degree of degree of freedom uh, are considered to uh, perform the path planning in the system. The strategy based on circular trajectory maybe is not optimal, but allow us to reach the desired point of, of uh, well proposed in this case. So the strategy used allows the robot to avoid different obstacles. And for future work, we have considered study scenarios with inclined, inclined and irregular surfaces to implement more sensors to observe the position of the robot and implement the control techniques in the non-linear model of the robot. And that's it. OK, well, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Actually, I have one. Uh, you mentioned that you work with a linearized model. Yeah, and actually, you presented in, a, I think, in a slide 15, at least for the, the simulation test. Uh, however, when you have a linearized model, it is well known you linearize around a, an equilibrium point, an equilibrium. But then you have a problem that the results you're going to get are local. Or is there a, a sort of a stability region for your results? Yeah. Yeah. So, do you determine this uh, region or do you have any idea about the, the performance of the system? Because for the simulation, you are using also the linearized model. What happened if you introduce your control signals into the original non-linear model? I think that's going to be a more realistic test for your controller. Instead of uh, putting this uh, controller into the linear model that after all this is based for the or is used for the design of the controller. Yeah, okay. Uh, in this case, for linearization, linearization, we are considering a range of uh, less uh, 30 to plus 30 degrees for the pendulum. So the results were shown in the figure. And uh, yeah, we 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 are considering, and one of the of the works that we want to do is precisely uh, implement this control using stochastic signals on or in the non-linear model of the robot to observe the behavior to be sure that. Uh, the the model well the linearized model uh, consider the the specifications of a nonlinear model. So in the in this work we we have not yet implemented this this control on the nonlinear model, but it is considered to be done. Any other question from the audience? Well, we thank you, and uh, with this uh, final talk, we uh, end our session, our first uh, session about mechatronics topic. And there's going to be going to be another uh, mechatronics topic session tomorrow, Friday at uh, 1 p.m. Mexico time. So, thank you very much to all the presenters, yep. and also to the audience. Thank you very much for being into this session of a mechatronics topic. Um, we hope to see you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro.